Well, let's welcome our Church Online family. Thank you guys for being with us today. Remember, we're a church on mission. Would you say it with me? Our mission is the reason that we exist, everything we do, this is what it is. It's to build God's kingdom one life at a time. Awesome. So our theme this year has been the word forward. And uh, I really believe that that the message we're going to get from the book of James today uh, has more potential to move our lives forward than just about anything else we could talk about all year long. At first glance, you might think, really, this is what we're going to talk about? But I'm telling you, it's, it's so, so very important we have this conversation. And uh, this week, God put on my heart that forever forward is going to be the new theme, that forward isn't big vision enough. Saying, you know, 2022 is all about forward. That's just one year. We need to move forever forward in God's kingdom. So I'm changing it from forward to forever forward. Would you say it with me? Forever forward. All right. We're going to move our families forward, our church forward, our communities forward, our lives forward by the grace of God. And I'm honored to get to do that with you. We've been doing this thing called ground game, and it's all about this one big idea, followers of Jesus follow Jesus. Followers of Jesus, follow Jesus. And that really is a summary of the book of James. Uh, the book of James is the New Testament book of wisdom. It's, it's full of all this practical wisdom to pursue a life of holiness. It's full of direct commands. James is, he's a really direct guy, okay? And so today I'm going to meet you in James chapter 3 in just a second. So get your Bibles open. If you don't have a Bible, let us know. We want to give you one before you leave today. Um, I'm calling today's sermon, Do You Kiss Your Mama With That Mouth? Just turn to your neighbor and ask him real quick, do you kiss your mama with that mouth? Come on, I need to know y'all with me. Do you kiss your mama with that mouth? That's the question of the day. And uh, James, if you remember week one, we were in chapter one, and he kind of gave us a preview of chapter three. Here's what he said in chapter one, verse 26. He says, if you claim to be religious, like you, you claim to be a follower of Jesus, but you don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. And your religion is worthless. Let's just have an altar call right now and get church over with. Come on, somebody. <laughs> like James couldn't be any more straightforward. And I'll never forget one of the first times, like I really did not think about what I was saying. It was uh, just over 20 years ago when I first got into ministry, my pastor sent me to do a hospital visit. It was one of my first hospital visits ever. I didn't have a lot of uh, experience in, in hospital visits. And he kind of prepped me. He said, I want you to go pray with this family. Um, this guy's having a surgery. And he said, and just so you know, it's like a 50-50 chance whether or not the guy's going to make it out of the surgery. This is very serious. So I need you to go and just comfort them and pray with them and read some scripture with them. So I show up at the hospital. I got the family. We're holding hands. We're praying over this guy. I mean, we're calling the healing of heaven down upon this guy's life. And then I say, in Jesus' name, amen. And I look the guy right in the eye and I said, brother, I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> well, think for a second. Okay, that could be taken different ways, couldn't it? Yeah. Like it could be, I, what I meant was, you're going to get through the surgery and I'll see you after surgery. The way he took it was, you're going to die. I'll see you in heaven. <laughs> And I was just like, that's not what I meant. I'm so sorry. And the reason I said that was I spoke without thinking. And I really stumbled over my words. And I don't know about you, but I think that's kind of a description of all of us. Amen? Yeah. James chapter 3, here's what he says. We all stumble in many ways. <laughs> and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to also bridle his entire body. So he's saying, like, if you can learn to literally tame your tongue... That's the most perfect life anyone could ever live. But we all know that we can't do it. We all stumble in many ways. Verse 3, if we, he, gets, he gets these word pictures. He pulls out these word pictures because he wants us to see how powerful our words are. He says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we can guide their whole entire bodies as well. I don't know if you've ever ridden a horse, but they'll take this tiny little piece of metal, weighs like a pound, and they put this one pound, little bitty piece of metal in the 2,000 pound Clydesdale's mouth, and now they can control the beast. And he says, your tongue is like that. It's that powerful. And then he says, let's talk about, you don't know about horses? Let's talk about sailing. Okay, James is all over the place. He says, look at the ships also. Although they're so large, they're driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So great big sailboat 
You have to have a great big sail to catch a little bit of wind to get it moving, but all you have to have to control it and maneuver it is a tiny little like triangular shaped piece of wood called a rudder. And he says, that's, that's your tongue. It seems so small and so insignificant, but it's actually very, very powerful. He continues, he says, so also the tongue is a small member. Seems small, seems insignificant, but it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. I know it seems weird, but I want you all to do something with me. Stick your tongue out. Just stick your tongue out. And everybody say, little bitty tongue, great big impact. So you'll remember it that way, okay? Seems like this little bitty thing, this little tiny wad of muscles, but it's actually the strongest muscle in all of your body. It literally steers you through this world and controls the destiny and the direction of your life. Your, your tongue, James is saying, is a lot like this. And I don't know if you can even see this, but I'm holding a match. And see, you, like, you have some of these at your house somewhere, and you don't think about them until you need them. You don't worry about the destruction that the little bitty box of matches in the kitchen cabinet could bring. But this is powerful. How many, powerful, how many of you know that? Like, I could do major damage with this. In fact, I brought some pictures just two weeks ago. A lawnmower set off a spark in the Dallas area, and it burned down or damaged 26 homes within minutes. You know, it's dry here in Texas. Come on, Jesus, we need some rain, okay? Isn't that amazing? Just, just think about that. Like, it doesn't even seem possible. That this match, look at it again. Like, look how I could just break this thing without even trying. It just fits in the palm of my hand right? Yeah, I could do billions of dollars of real estate damage with this little bitty thing. When you think about it, it's like, that doesn't even make sense. That something so tiny could be so powerful. And that's what James is saying. He's saying, here, write it down. He's saying the tongue is much more powerful than we understand. The tongue is so much more powerful than we understand, so much more powerful than we think about or, or then we realize it and that's why sometimes you'll say something and then the other person blows up and you're like I don't see what the big deal is all, all I did was match and then they went full on grass fire and it was because of the words that that came out of your mouth like a microphone's a great example too this is a tiny little tool that we use here at church but think of the great big damage I could do to this church with this little bitty thing if I said certain things I could grow our church in reverse really, really quick with some certain words. God takes our words so much more serious than we do. I think that's what James is trying to get us to understand. It's kind of like the way that we treat sin. So God doesn't treat sin like this. God teaches throughout the Bible there's different sins that affect us in different ways, but he never teaches us in the Bible that different sins are worse. To him, sin is sin and separates us from him. But we don't like that. We categorize it. So we have like over here are the extreme sins, murder, adultery, right? The untouchable sin, don't do that. And then we have like the medium category sins, stealing, but it'll be okay. We'll get through it. Lying, but it's okay. Like sometimes you got to lie, right? Like you just got to. So, and then we have these like sins we don't even think about and our words kind of fit over here if we're being honest. The tongue's so much more powerful than we understand. We... We just don't think about how much weight our words carry. And if you don't believe me, I want you to write this down. Proverbs chapter 6. Go look at it this week. Proverbs chapter 6 is one of the only places in all of the Bible where God gives a list of things that he hates. And he lists six things that he hates. And when you go look at this list, I want you to notice three of the six things he hates have to do with words we speak. Because God understands the tongue is so, so very powerful. I'm going to bring my wife up here to help me for a second. Because can we be honest that we live in a culture that thinks everybody should be able to say whatever they want, however they want, to whoever they want, whenever they want, with whatever choice words they, like literally, you just blur. And by the way, um, James didn't have cell phones or Twitter, so this isn't included in there. But can we just admit, like, this isn't just about tongues, it's about thumbs. So just like our words are that powerful, so is the comment section. So is the post. 
So is the text. Those are words too. We've changed a little. We've modernized a little. But the, the world says this. Culture says, sticks and stones may break my bones. But words are just like ping pong balls. They're not going to hurt me. They sting a little, but they just bounce right off. How many of you were taught that? Sticks and stones. My wife's liking this way too much. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Come on, show of hands. Who was taught that? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's a lie, isn't it? Here's the truth. Sticks and stones may break my bones, and so will words, because they're heavy. Come on, who knows that's true? Thank you, you're awesome. So, some of you know it's true, because some of you have been carrying around the weight of words that were spoke to you in the sixth grade. You've been, and it's not just one thing. A lot of things were said to you. You're not just carrying one 20-pound slam ball. You're carrying 10 of them. This is the biggest lie ever. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Baloney. <laughs> words do hurt because words aren't like ping pong balls. That's not, a, that's not what words are like. Words are like, I'm not going to throw this at you, Travis, but. <laughs> and we all know it's true. We all know that it's true. Think about it. World wars have started because of words. Divorces happen all the time because of words. Civil wars, nations have divided because of words. Families have been torn apart because of words. James is trying to get us to see that our words, if we're not careful, they will set off a fire that we cannot stop. Now, again, I've, I've preached on words a lot because the Bible talks about it a lot. In fact, if you go read the whole book of Proverbs, there's 31 of them. Almost every single one of them talks about words. He's trying to get us to understand. We think words are kind of insignificant sometimes. We've bought into a lie. Words are not insignificant. They're weighty. Why is that? Why are they so weighty? Words are weighty because they set a course and then send us in a direction in life. That's why our words matter so much. That's why our tongues are so much more powerful than we understand. We receive words spoken over us, or we speak words over ourselves, or we speak words to others. Those words set a course and send us in a direction. I'm so grateful for my parents. They weren't perfect parents. No parent is perfect, but they spoke life over me. They believed in me. They spoke to my potential. I'll never forget my hockey coach uh, when I was 13, 14, 15 years old. His name was J.B. Bennett, and he spoke life over me. Now, he was a coach. Sometimes he had to get in my face. Sometimes in the heat of the game, but he always used the right words at the right time with the right tone. And so even when he was all over me, he was getting after me. I knew that he was for me, that he believed in me, that he was saying, there's more in you. You can do better. I'll never forget that. I'm so grateful for that. And, and so listen, if you serve with Rev Kids, I, I'm so grateful for you, but I want you to know something. Run the play. Okay, we, we show a video. We sing some songs. We teach the kids a scripture and a, a point. But even more than that, let me tell you what you do with those, those kids. You speak life over them. You look them in the eye and you say, I'm so happy you're here. I'm so glad you came to church. I'm so proud of you. I love that I get to see you on Sundays. Same with mixed youth. Mixed youth, small group leaders especially, like run the play. We, we do game time. We do tribe night. We serve pizza and donuts. You know, the mix is, it's a blast. We worship. Pastor Paul preaches or somebody preaches. But, but even more than that, you look those teenagers in the eye and you say, I believe in you. There's more, there's more in you because of the God that's in you and the God that's with you. That's what we do. And it's not only words that we speak to others. It's words we speak to ourselves too. So if you, if you go study the nation of Israel, when they, they leave Egypt, they're slaves in Egypt. They leave Egypt, God frees them, and then they get out in the desert and they've got nothing to eat. So they start, the Bible says they start grumbling. And there's a lot of people in church that get into grumble mode. And then they miss out on what God wants to do because of the words they're speaking over themselves. So Israel starts grumbling. Let's just go back to being slaves. At least we had green beans in Egypt. I don't know what they have in Egypt. Leeks. I think they have leeks. Who wants to eat that? But they're like, let's go back to that. Let's go back to leeks. Lima beans. That's a better modern day version of it. Who likes lima beans in here? Two people. Exactly what I thought. Like, 
Four people raise their hand, but we know two of them are lying, all right? <laughs> so like, let's go back to Egypt. So God provides miraculously. He, he answers their prayer. He rains down manna, which was seed that they could ground, grind up and make into bread. And so he literally provides for them. They eat it just a couple days, and then they start grumbling again. And the point of their grumbling is this. They never get to enter into the promised land. An entire generation dies off in the desert because of their grumbling, because of the words of death they speak over themselves. Then you go to Numbers chapter 13. They send 12 spies into the promised land. Ten of them come back with a negative report. All 12 spies see the same thing. Ten choose to speak words of death. Ten of them come back and they say, we cannot go in. They are stronger than we are. But two of them, Joshua and Caleb, made a different choice. They come back and they speak words of life. They say, we can certainly conquer it. I want to ask you, are you a, I can certainly conquer it person? Or are you a, oh, they're too strong and I'm too weak person? And that's important to wrestle with that question because the fact is we shape our words and then our words shape us. What kind of words are you speaking over yourself? Verse 6, James continues, and he's going to give us the best theology on your tongue in all of the Bible. He says, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members. It's a body part, just like all the other body parts, but check it out. It stains the entire body, setting on fire the entire course of life, <laughs> I told you James doesn't pull any punches. And he ends, he says, by the way, in your tongue, it is set on fire by hell. Some of you parents need to use that line with your teenagers, all right? Say, What's he saying? I'll tell you what he's saying. You know how when you get a new phone or a new computer, it's got all these default settings and you don't like the way it's set up. So the first thing you have to do, you got to log in and you got to change all the default settings, right? Because you don't want it to beep at you when that thing goes out. You don't want it to make that noise. You like this noise better. That volume's too loud. You need to, if you're like me, I just had to, for almost 41 years old, just had to raise the font size up a little bit, y'all. <laughs> I'm there. My son was looking at my phone the other day and he goes, why is your font so big on your phone? I was like, those are words of death. <laughs> but just like your phone has default settings, your tongue has a default setting. And the default setting on your tongue is evil and destruction. See, if you're a Christian, you have to agree with that. One, because it's in the Bible. But two, because we believe that when sin entered the world, it stained everything, including your tongue. It got every single part of who we are. When you were born, you were armed with a loaded weapon at birth called the tongue. All parents know that. Because you've never had to teach your kid to say mean stuff. Come on, where are my parents at? Amen. You have never had to teach your kids how to be ugly with their mouth. They just figured it out all on their own. It's because of the default setting. You've only ever had to teach them to speak nicely, right? Like we say please, we say thank you, we don't say sucks, we don't say stupid, we don't say shut up. Like you, you've had to just... Teach them the good stuff, not the bad stuff. Why, why is that? Because our words are powerful. Again, our words can burn everything down. They, they bring death. They bring dis destruction. They're, they're full of evil. You're, you could say it this way. Your tongue is inherently evil. It's inherently evil. You can ruin your marriage with your tongue. You can lose your job with your tongue. You can ruin any relationship with your tongue. There, there's no limit to the destruction that can happen when you speak death. It, it's like a match. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation when it comes to your words. One little bitty word, the damage can be huge. God's telling us, you need to understand how powerful your words are. Proverbs says in chapter 10, verse 19, this, this is a scripture that I did not choose to be a life scripture, but I, I speak professionally, I talk a lot, I talk for a living, <laughs> and then God always calls this first to mind. Here's what it says. It says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and shut your mouth. Some of you are like, that's in the Bible? Yes. I didn't make it up. That's Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. Here's the Zach translation, okay? You don't need to say every little thing you think, but you do need to think a little before every little thing you say. I'll say it again for the people in the back. You don't need to say every little thing you think, but you do need to think a little before every little thing you say. 
It's so true, isn't it? Words matter. Are we getting it? All right, here's what he says in verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird, every kind of reptile, every kind of sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. We're not scared of animals these days. We put animals in the zoo. You can go to the zoo and you can talk to the animals and laugh and look at how cute they are, even though that animal might rip your head off in the wild. We don't fear animals, right? But then he says this. He says, no human being can tame the tongue. Like, we, we've tamed the animal kingdom, but no human being has tamed the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. The tongue cannot be tamed by man. We can't do it. You can't do it. I can't do it. James is telling us, he, he's saying, you cannot tame your tongue on, a, on your own. There's, there's never going to be a point where you just get to perfect word perfection and it's just fixed and you don't have to worry about it. It's something to always be mindful of. It's an area that's very easy to slip and it matters because words carry weight. Then he says in verse 9, he does this compare and contrast and I love it. He says, with our tongue, He's like, think about how ridiculous this is, people. He says, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. And then, like with that exact same tongue, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. That's so true, isn't it? Like today you're in church, and I love watching you worship and worshiping with your church. You're like singing the praises of Jesus, but then some of you are going to get on I-35, and with that same tongue singing the praises of Jesus, you're going to be singing something else. Rich and fries and fries, right, 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 yeah, right. like somebody's going to cut you off. You're going to let them have, or they're going to get your order wrong at the at Chewy's after this, and you're going to let them have it. And and what James is saying is that shouldn't even be possible. He's like, think about how crazy this is that we bless the Lord, oh my soul, hallelujah, and then with the same tongue, like think about some of the stuff we say. He says in verse ten, for from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be. So, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh water and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Again, he's not saying, like, our tongues are really bad. Now he's saying, not only are they really bad, but the thing that we do with them, like, it shouldn't even be possible. And yet we totally do it. Why is that? It's because there's a connection. It's not just about our tongue. It's about our hearts. My tongue reveals what's in my heart. If you're one of those people like, really, we're going to talk about words? Isn't, shouldn't this have been a junior high kids message, pastor? You, and you don't think words are that important? Well, let me ask you this. Is your heart important? Is your soul important? Yeah, we agree on that. Well, your tongue reveals that. Your tongue reveals your heart. It reveals your soul. And I don't know about you, but I'll just be honest about my life. There's a lot of stuff going on in that heart. And some of it's terrible and ugly and broken and sinful. And some of it's good and holy. Some of it's blessing. Some of it's cursing. And so I got to think about my heart if I'm going to get what comes out of my mouth right. And if you find yourself in this mode where it's like, man, all I do is I'm just critical and I'm, I'm condemning and I just put people down, maybe there's something going on in your heart. Maybe it's time for a soul check. And James used the imagery of a freshwater spring. You need to know, anytime there's a freshwater spring in the Bible, it's a representation of the heart. The wellspring of your life. What's going on in your heart? Words matter so much because the thing behind words matters so much. The real problem is not my tongue. The real problem is my heart. But I love how he compared and contrasted because just like the tongue can be crazy destructive, it can also be extremely productive. Amen? It's our choice. The, the tongue can be destructive or it can be productive. It has this contrast. So much bad it can do. But that means there's also so much good it can do. So what do we do to do more good with our tongue and be more productive than destructive? Like, how do we shift more towards productivity with our mouths than destruction with our mouths? Think about the heart connection. It starts with the heart. So step one is to allow God to change your heart. And by the way, that is not a, well, I, I did that. I gave my life to Jesus back in the sixth grade pastor thing. It is a every single day thing. 
God, change me by the renewing of my heart. God, refresh my soul. God, convict me. God, call me out. Change my heart. We need to wake up every day like that. If your faith is only an intellectual thing, nothing will ever change. It's got to be a soul thing. It's got to be a heart thing. You can fake some things, but listen, you can't fake forgiveness and hope and joy and love and praise. So if your heart doesn't change, nothing will change. Hebrews 8, God says, I will put my laws into your minds and I will write my laws on your hearts. You will be my people and I will be your God. He cares about the heart. God says in Psalm 19, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. He cares about the words and the heart. The psalmist says, may it all be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Like what could happen if you woke up every day and you said, God, I need some heart surgery. I noticed some stuff was coming out of my mouth. I didn't think much before I said it. And I know that reveals something in my heart. Would you cut that thing out, Lord? And just like we have to wake up every day and trust God to change our hearts, we have a part to play in this process also. So the second step is to filter what you allow into your heart that God is changing day by day. Like be open, allow God to do his work, but then you have a role to play. You got to install a filter over that heart. And I'm telling you, it's hard because we are surrounded by negativity, negative thoughts, negative web- websites, negative news cycles, Uh, Some of us have relationships with the wrong people. We're looking at the wrong things online. We want to do the right things, but we're filling our mind with negative music, negative movies, negative television shows. What kind of a treasure chest are you filling up in your heart? I want you to think of a literal treasure chest. And every day, you're sticking stuff in it. What kind of stuff are you sticking in it? That's what's going to come out of your mouth. And that wasn't my idea, it's Jesus' idea. He said in Matthew 12, You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What are you stuffing in that heart treasure chest? Good stuff or evil stuff, that's what's going to come out of you. Proverbs 4.23 says, since you got that, treasure chest and you're continually filling it up, you need to be on guard. Guard your heart, it says, above all else, for it is the wellspring. It determines the course of your life. So what if you just pause for a second and you just allow God to speak to you? Like, is there anything creating a treasury of evil in your heart that you need God to cut out? Because until it's removed, you won't get the words right. And that matters because words are powerful. They set a course and they send us in a direction. And then the last step is to actually begin to speak words of life. Like not just to learn this stuff from James, but to actually do it. And I'm so excited about how we're going to close out today because some of us, we, it's been so long since we've spoke words of life, or we never have, or maybe the kind of family we grew up in, they didn't speak words of life. So we don't even know what that sounds like. And I want to help you know what it sounds like. So here's a quick list. It's not a full list in the Bible, but it's the ones that I thought of this week. Words of of affection. I was with a bunch of pastors this week at a conference. These are guys I love. They're they're brothers. And when I first met these guys, they would always say, I love you, Zach. Because I'm a typical dude, I was like, okay. Easy, bro, right? Like, don't use the L word. We're just hanging, okay? But over time, I've learned no if you have affection for somebody, you should tell them. And so now, I, this week, I was proud of myself. <laughs> I said to these, I got them, I beat them too. I was like, I love you. And they're like, whoa, you know. <laughs> hey, man, I love you so much. These are guys I love, so, so I tell them. Married people, some of you have underestimated how badly your spouse needs to hear multiple times a day. I love you. You just look in their eyes. I love you. Not just when you're headed out the door. Love you. Love you. <laughs> What'd you say? I do, I do. <laughs> the room's away. They don't even know what you said. No. Face to face. I love you. Parents, your kids need to hear. I love you. I am so proud of you. I'm, I can't believe God picked me to be your dad. He could have picked anybody. I get to be your dad. For the moms in the room, I get to be your mom. Your kids need to hear that so bad. They're not going to hear it out there. 
They need to hear it from you. Words of affection. You know who set the example for us? God the Father set the example as he spoke to God the Son. Okay, so all through the New Testament, Jesus is praying. He's spending time with his heavenly Father. But only two of those times do we know what the Father said to the Son. And he said the same thing both times, probably because it's the same thing he said to him every day. We get it at the baptism of Jesus and the Mount of Transfiguration. What did he say? He said, this is my son whom, who I love. I'm proud of him. I'm well pleased with him. I'm so pumped to be his dad. That's what God the Father said to God the Son. That's what God said to Jesus. So just to model it to you, and because it's true and I mean it, Amber, will you look up here? I love you. You're my wife and I love you. My son's in the room, Cooper. I'm so proud of you. I love you. I'm so proud to be your dad. I love seeing what God's doing in your life. My daughter, I think she's in the back. She's probably watching on the TV. Annabelle, I love you. I love you so much. Are you speaking words of affection? It matters. Some of you are like, you're like too hard, right? Just hardened by life. You're too much of a tough guy. And maybe, again, maybe it comes from your own upbringing. I'm telling you, you've got to learn to get this right. You're my church family, by the way, and I love you. I absolutely love you. Most of you don't know. I had an opportunity. I'm going to tell them I've never said this publicly. I had an opportunity, what, eight years ago, maybe, to go take over a church that had about 12,000 people, beautiful building, multiple campuses. And I said, no, I love my church. God called me to this family. Don't give me too much credit. It's in Oklahoma. I'm not going to live there. <laughs> if it was in Texas, y'all would have a new pastor, right? No, no I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Words of affection. Words of affection. How about words of praise? Where you say, good job. Good job. I want to say to our dream team, good job. I'm so honored to do ministry with you. Good job. Don't you dare let the devil tell you all you're doing is holding a door. No, you're making this place more welcoming. Don't you dare let the devil tell you you're just pushing buttons in the sound booth. No, you're making sure people online can enjoy service and connect. You're making sure we have the lights and the sound, and you're making a huge difference. Don't you dare let the, the, the devil tell you, band, you're just strumming some guitars. You can do that in a bar. No, you're bringing heaven to earth so people can meet Jesus. And you're doing a great job. I'm so pumped to go to the drive-in movie tonight because here's what it's about. I hope you'll come. It's just for us to praise the dream team, to say you're doing a great job. My wife's great at this. Proverbs 25, 11 says a word fitly spoken, which means right word at the right time, is like an apple of gold in a setting of silver. She, she's always been good at this. She just praises people. Like the, wait, the, the waiter or the kitchen at the restaurant will get her order totally wrong and somehow she just, she's like, it's okay that I ordered a steak and I got a salad. You're doing great. Salad's amazing. She just makes people feel good. Have you ever been through TSA at the airport? That's a hard one. She praises them. I love the way you, you're wanding me right now. You're so good at your job. <laughs> Woo, right? She just knows how to praise people. And then words of encouragement, and that's different. Okay, words of praise are, you, you're doing a good job. Words are encur of encouragement are, there's more in you. God's got more for you. And listen, we should be the most encouraging people on the face of the planet. You know why? I've read the end of the Bible. We win, so we really have nothing to worry about. We don't have to be out there running people down. We win. Let's encourage people. Ephesians 4 says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, only what is good for building up and encouraging that it may give grace to those who hear. Words of healing. Sometimes we're scared to speak words of healing, believing God to do miracles, because it's like there's this, there's this thought, well, what if it doesn't happen? And that's tension we're gonna have to learn to live in. But just because there's that tension between death that we see on this earth and eternal life that we have in heaven doesn't mean we don't speak God's healing over people. 
And I'm not just talking physical healing. I'm talking uh, healing from drug addictions and healing in people's marriages and prodigal teenagers coming back home, coming back to the church, believing in God. I'm talking about the healing of the kingdom of heaven. We're citizens of heaven. We need to bring healing. Every room we walk into ought to get better just because we're there and we're speaking words of healing. And then last, words of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of what we cannot see. Today, the world can only see what it sees, so people just yell about what they see. But we're people of faith. We can see what the world cannot see, so we can call out the goodness in people, the masterpieces that people are. Romans 4 says that God gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. So when we talk to people, we can remind them of who they are in Christ. We can speak to who they could be with Jesus Christ in their life. So here's what I want to do. I want you to do it. And I'm not going to give you the opportunity to walk out to the parking lot and get in your car and change your mind. We're going to do it now. You're here with spouse, family member, one of your kids, one of your friends. Some of you are here alone. Get your phone right now. And you're going to be the bigger person. You're going to use your thumbs and send somebody something encouraging. What I want to happen, it's happened every service. I just just want this room to erupt with people speaking to each other. Words of faith, words of affection, words of praise, words of encouragement, words of healing. Right now, come on, husbands lead the way. Lean over and say, I love you. I'm proud of you. I care about you. There's more inside of you because of the God that is with you. So good. Come on, stand up to your feet as you continue. Keep talking to each other. Stand up to your feet. We're going to sing together, and now what I want you to do, I'm going to give you another chance. Some of you didn't say what you know you really need to say. You're going to say it right now. Last chance as we sing. We're going to get up. We're going to praise God with our mouths. Some of you are going to talk. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Some of you need to pray over somebody. You need to squeeze their hand. You need to look them in the eye. You need to say, I love you. I'm proud of you. Come on, all over the place. God's doing something. of faith, words of healing. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you be shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a light inside of those songs. So get up and praise the Lord. So good. Would you pray with me, Heavenly Father? I thank you for a church willing to take steps. God, the days of walking out to our cars and forgetting are gone. We're moving forever forward. By your grace, by your strength, we're moving families forward. We're moving addicts forward. We're moving our church forward, our community forward. God, we trust you in the process. Even when it's uncomfortable, God, push on our hearts. And God, as your church, Help us to go out into this broken, curse-filled world. There's enough of that going on. And be the ones who speak life. Father, help us to be the ones that bring blessings. Help us to always remember the power of our tongue. And listen, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, do you know what the Bible says? It says, further affirming this message, it says this. It says, if you will confess with your tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So even your eternity hinges on whether or not you will verbally declare that Jesus Christ is the only way, out loud, a public declaration. Some of you have never done that, and it's gonna change right now. What we'd like to do is lead you in a prayer, and if you're the one taking the step, God knows it, you know it, He hears the words, the person next to you hears the words. And when we're done and we say amen, we'll get to say welcome to God's family. Let's all pray it together. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. 
Change me, God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. I trust Jesus. I surrender wholeheartedly. I give you my life, God. I repent from my sin. I trust you, God, to give me a home in heaven forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's make some noise for what God's doing. Come on.